You know, as I approach a two-year anniversary with the COPS office, I can easily say this is the, uh, one of the proudest moments since I came here. So many uh, of you in this room have been gracious hosts to myself and to other COPS representatives, and it's an absolute privilege to return the favor after, after several years of, of not having a conference. It was really a, our honor and privilege to be able to put this together. Our aim this week is rather selfish. Obviously, each of you sign up to attend conferences such as this to learn more about the field, and that's absolutely true here. But the information that you're going to share with us as we talk about policing in this changing economy is going to provide an amazing takeaway for our office. Our goal is to offer you a variety of resources and learning opportunities to help advance public safety in each of your communities. There are a number of familiar faces here. There are a number of, of folks here that I have been friends with for, for years, and some of you I've just had the pleasure recently to, to get to know. Um, and I, if I start trying to acknowledge people from this podium, uh, we won't have time to do anything else. Uh, so I just want to say welcome, welcome to all of you. But I certainly can't start without recognizing the incredible work of the men and women who make up the COPS office. Not just the efforts here today with this very special gathering, but the number of successes and contributions to the law enforcement field that they have made over the last 17 years. You will want to know to get these employees, uh, these folks around the conference, you'll want to get to know them a little bit better. They have blue tags on their, uh, on their name uh, badges that identify them and please reach out to them uh, if you can be of any assistance in any way. The folks that work in this office, uh, I've discovered since I came to Washington, are some of the best and brightest people in our field. They're subject matter experts in areas of gangs, drug endangered children, officer safety, homeland security, uh, and even gasoline prices. The COPS office sitting alongside you drafted over 750 publications on public safety topics, distributed three million copies of those materials. They have shaped the curriculum that have uh, trained over half a million officers and deputy sheriffs, uh, all uh, free of charge to the law enforcement agencies. Oh yes, and we do also do grants. Uh, at our office, uh, with less than 175 employees at any given time, uh, we have managed over $13.5 billion in grants awarded to more than 13,000 agencies. But the times have changed dramatically. When this office started, uh, we were able to fund on any given year 90 to 95 percent of the agencies that applied under the hiring and community policing development programs. Over the last couple of years, that range has been in the 12 to 15 percent range, mostly because of the impact of the economy on each of your agencies. However, one of the points of this conference this year uh, is to help us deal with this new reality. I do believe uh, and not just because I work here, but I do believe that this office adds incredible value to the field of law enforcement and policing. I believe that before I ever came here. I feel very strongly that with the resources that we have available, the partnerships we've created, and the innovations that we have fostered and shared, that the COPS office is and remains an essential tool for public safety. As both the Vice President and the Attorney General have stated, the goal of this office was never to hire 100,000 police officers. The goal was to forge strong relationships between law enforcement and the communities they serve. It was to redesign the practice of public safety into a truly collective and collaborative effort. And I believe that the changes that I have watched, uh, certainly in my tenure in this field, uh, is a direct result of the contribution of this office. The mission of the COPS office today continues to be to advance public safety through community policing, which means building relationships and solving problems. And within that mission, there are three key factors that continue to push this office forward. The COPS office is local, the COPS office is direct, and the COPS office works. In 2008, as every one of you in this room is all too aware, uh, we experienced the greatest uh, economic uh, crisis since the Great Depression. In my 37-year career, I've never seen an economic hit like the one that this country took. I've never seen layoffs and furloughs in law enforcement on the scale that we have seen over the last two or three years. 
In every corner of this country, state, local, and tribal police departments are laying off officers and civilian staff or modifying their operation as a result of budget cuts. Like many in law enforcement, I believe that these changes uh, are likely to remain permanent, and I believe that they will fundamentally change the delivery of police service over the next five to 10 years. I believe that these changes will occur along four fronts. One, greater use of technology uh, to deliver our services. Two, greater utilization of non-sworn personnel, both as volunteers and as employees. Thirdly, a dramatically different handling of non-emergency and administrative calls, such as crime reports that have no suspects or responding to false alarm. And fourth, the area of regionalization or consolidation, which need not mean a loss of departmental identity, but may well mean a sharing of core services. At the COPS office, we've redeveloped and redesigned our primary grant program to better address the budget challenges that each of you are experiencing. In the last two years, nearly $1.5 billion has been delivered straight to the local level to hire new officers and to protect law enforcement jobs that are in jeopardy of being cut. This year, we put a focus on the issues. This year, applicants were asked to describe to our office their most pressing public safety issue, whether it was gang violence, school safety, drug dealing, or whatever, but to provide us details on how you intend to employ the principles of community policing to address those challenges. We will not ever attempt to tell you what problems that you should address or how you should do it, because local problems demand local solutions. But asking what problem you want to solve and how we can support that effort makes us good stewards of federal funding and ensures that the projects that we fund will achieve the desired outcomes of safer communities and efficient delivery of law enforcement services. We're also striving to apply the principles of community policing and procedural justice to relationships between law enforcement unions and law enforcement management. With difficult budget issues, a mutually arrived at understanding can stabilize the local budget and keep personnel and resources where they are needed most. It is no longer enough for us to say that we helped hire 100,000 officers. The question that we have to answer is are your communities and neighborhoods safer because those officers are there? And how can future hiring programs benefit local communities and local residents? The COPS office is local because your concerns are our concerns and your work shapes our work. One of my goals is to create a national database uh, in the COPS office. Every police officer in this country uh, ought to be able, who's struggling with a particular problem, ought to be able to go to the Department of Justice and whether through the COPS office or the Office of Justice programs, instantly find a link to departments across the country uh, who have addressed similar problems and learn what, how they have addressed that issue rather than simply needing to try to reinvent the wheel, as it were. The COPS office has been involved in the creation of the National Network for Safe Communities in partnership with John Jay College in New York. Uh, we've also been involved with the developing of the teaching police department model through the efforts of Roger Williams University uh, and then Chief Dean Esserman, which I believe will revolutionize law enforcement training in this country. Through real-time programs and readily available resources, the COPS office serves as a first responder to first responders. The COPS office is direct, quick to answer the call of the administration to help save law enforcement jobs, and equally quick to help a tribal chief concerned about gang activity on sacred native land. The COPS office began operation in response to the staggering crime rates in the 90s, and today that direct assistance continues through our efforts to help cities and counties throughout the country. Every year we solicit your application the first of every summer and our awards are made before the weather cools in the fall. And there are two agencies involved, yours and ours. Our goal is to create the shortest spool of red tape you'll ever find. Over 500 law enforcement officials along with their mayors, council members and city managers visit the COPS office each spring to provide our staff a personal account of their community policing strategies and successes. We have the reputation of being good listeners, which some have suggested is a rare commodity inside the Beltway. What we have heard is that community policing is a proven practice in small and large agencies dealing with bigger and bigger problems. 
And as we hope to work through this next two days, the idea that the economy is going to change the delivery of police services, the idea that each of you is struggling with shrinking resources, I believe and we believe at the COPS office that community policing becomes more important to your success and not less. We are making great strides towards institutionalizing community policing, rightly labeling this practice as a philosophy and not a unit or a position or a project, but a philosophy that can guide law enforcement professionals and make our communities safer places to live, work, and play. It is with your help that we can serve as innovators in new ways of thinking about law enforcement service delivery. Values-based policing, procedural justice, and a renewed focus on officer ethics and integrity are just some of the changes coming down the road in our profession. Michael Josephson of the Josephson Ethics Institute has a program called the Exemplary Peace Officer Program. And in it, he challenges officers, and I think in the way he challenges all of us, to change the fundamental question about how we do business from can I do this to should I do this. Being a community policing organization requires challenging everyone in an agency to be flexible, innovative, and to work to expand their understanding of what belongs in the portfolio of police responsibility. The COPS office is always ready to be your vital partner in helping to advance public safety in this new economy. That's why the COPS office works, and we appreciate the opportunity to work with so many dedicated law enforcement agencies and practitioners. In closing, let me refer to uh, Joel Kotkin, a sociologist, in his book, The City. He said that for a city to be viable, it needed to be three things. It needed to be sacred, it needed to be safe, and it needed to be busy. It needed to be sacred in the sense of calling people to service, of calling people to serve something greater than themselves, and evoking a sense of connection and belonging. It needed to be safe in the sense that people ought not to even have to think about their safety as they go about living their daily lives. And it needed to be busy in the sense of being economically viable. It is through your efforts that your communities will become sacred, safe, and busy. This economy is producing significant challenges to our profession. But I have no doubt that every one of you in this room is absolutely up to that challenges. The times are challenging, and change is afoot. And we're glad to welcome you to the 2011 COPS Conference. Thank you.